Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. We aren't quite to the top of the hour, so I'm going to allow a little time for everyone to join us from the lobby, and then we'll get started. It does look like there are a couple more people still in the lobby, but I'll go ahead and get us kicked off. Uh, welcome to the Rural Health Executive Education Series. I am Cody Smith, the Partnership Manager with NRHA Service Corporation, and I will be serving as your moderator for today's presentation. Before we dive in, please note there is a short survey at the end of the session. If you could just take a moment and fill that out, I would really appreciate it. Your feedback is really important in helping me to uh, tailor our future series to best serve your needs. Few housekeeping items I'd like to go over. All attendees are muted during the session. This does just to help avoid background noise. Uh, we do aim to wrap up the presentation in about 45 minutes, give or take, uh, followed by a Q&A session. If you have questions for the presenter at any time, please feel free to type those into the questions section of the webinar control panel, and I'll be sure that we address it at the end. I'd also like to remind you that this event is being recorded. I did get a couple emails already today asking about that. It is recorded as always, and we will send a link out to you tomorrow so that you can access that or share it as you need. Today, we have the privilege of hearing from John Downs, principal of Stradwater Associates. John is presenting strategic planning, best practices for rural healthcare. Uh, but before we do that, before we begin, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to our dedicated partner, Stradwater Associates. John, we're so grateful for your continued support and industry expertise, which allows us to host events like this, um, our upcoming conference in September in Kansas City, the Critical Access Hospital Conference, and other events that are dedicated to improving rural health care. Your support is crucial to our mission at advancing rural health initiatives. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to John for our feature presentation. Perfect. Thanks so much, Cody. Um, so uh, we're going to talk today about strategic planning and how we can use that and what some of the best practices for rural hospitals are. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about who I am. Uh, my name is John Downs and I've been a principal at Stroudwater since 2009. Prior to that, I was a partner inside of an architectural firm based in Boston uh, that designed healthcare spaces. Uh, I am not an architect by training. I just happened to uh, fall into that job, absolutely loved it, did a lot of work with Stroudwater, and then they recruited me to join them back in 2009. Uh, at Stroudwater, I focus primarily on three areas. One is leading the market analysis work, really that underpins most of our other types of projects. Strategic planning is another area that I focus on, and I'll talk a little bit about that today. And then finally, master facility planning, how we start looking at spaces. And I know there's a, a second part to this webinar series uh, that I'll be doing in a few weeks to talk specifically about master facility planning. Uh, outside of work, uh, I am absolutely addicted to golf. If I don't have to be working, I'd much rather be on the golf course. Uh, and I love gourmet cooking. Uh, so let's jump right into it. Uh, starting with, you know, what are truly the best practices as we've seen them? I've probably done uh, in the last five years, probably 50 or 60 uh, strategic plans with rural hospital clients around the country. Uh, and so the key things that I would take away from that, number one is make sure to engage your internal stakeholders as active authors of the plan, not just you know, someone that pays a consultant to develop a plan, but actually authors the plan themselves. Uh, make sure that we're grounding our planning in the realities of who you are and where you are, the local, the regional, and the national healthcare markets. We've got to be realistic about what we're doing. In order to do that, we must use real data. We can't do supposition. We can't think about, well, there was that one time that we have to be able to look at real data if we're going to do accurate strategic planning. To the extent possible, the faster you can execute these types of projects, streamlining the process helps to keep focus. Uh, I always say when I go out to clients that 
you know, this is my day job. My day job is to do consulting engagements and help folks uh, with strategic planning and other types of things. Your day jobs are keeping hospitals up and running. They're keeping patients safe, getting them well. And so we need to make sure that we're focusing the process so that you can continue to do the things that you need to do. Uh, we've got to think about strategic planning as the delivery system and the payment system both transition. You know, as we move towards value-based care, we've got to think about what that means on the delivery side as well as the payment side. Uh, but just because we're thinking about something that might be three or five or 10 years out into the future, we've got to prioritize the here and now. Too often we get into a situation where we're looking so far into the future and we're running the risk of actually putting ourselves out of business today. So prioritizing the here and now is absolutely critical. Uh, measure, 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 right? If we're not going to measure things, track them, and then adjust our planning as necessary, then any strategic plan doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. And finally, you know, the process of strategic planning, the outcome of strategic planning can be hard sometimes, right? It's like making sausage. Uh, it doesn't always look great, but it tastes good at the back end. Uh, we want to make sure we're celebrating the success, celebrate the success of completing the process of develop developing a plan, celebrate those milestones when you do something that you've tried uh, to achieve, and you know, even identify those areas where perhaps you weren't as successful as you wanted to be and look for opportunities to celebrate things in there as well. Uh, I'll start by saying, you know you best. Uh, strategic planning is not something that you can go on to, I'm sure there's some AI app that's going to disagree with me, uh, but it is not something where I would recommend you are going online saying, can I have a strategic plan for a 14 bed critical access hospital in Iowa? Uh, it is local. We need to think about it, not cookie cutter, but something local to what you do and who you are. I'd say using external assistance for expertise in guidance is good, but not for writing the plan. One of the things that I'll often say to clients is, because we've helped to write lots of plans, think of my hand as guiding your hand in writing something, but it needs to be your penmanship. It needs to be your thoughts that are getting down onto the page. No one is as connected to your community as you are. What can external folks uh, be helpful for, whether those are physical folks or that's on the internet? Uh, data, right? Bringing data to a decision-making process is often something that we need to get from the exterior. Uh, bringing examples of other places where things have been tried or things have worked, or maybe they've been tried and they failed. Uh, so, you know, using external folks to broaden your own reach is really, really helpful. Uh, and then finally, minimizing some of the emotions in decision making. You know, oftentimes we've got to make some hard decisions about service lines, uh, about where we should make our investments, what type of staff we need, what don't we need in this particular market, and having someone else that perhaps can be the bad guy. Well, it was, you know, XYZ's fault that we did that because they told us not to. Uh, I'm happy to be the bad guy in those types of scenarios. So really helping to minimize some of those emotions. Uh, another thing is engaging senior leadership, medical staff, and the board early in the process. And that really starts before the process kicks off so that you can have a common fact base, right? Understand, here's what's going on in the industry. In the industry. Here's what it means for us locally. Here's what some of the volumes and the numbers are for us here at our facility. If we all start from the same fact base, it's a lot easier to make decisions later on because we go back to those facts. We can engage that team around developing themes about what we're great at. What are our areas of opportunity? Are we aligned with our providers or are there ways that we can do that better? And what do we think that future vision of the organization might be? Uh, developing meaningful, measurable action items and tracking them and recognizing that any strategic plan must be a livable document. I'll talk about it a little bit at the end. I think ideally a three-year strategic plan is the right time frame. It gives us enough time to be bold and look out towards the future, but it also doesn't get too far out uh, where it starts to become unrealistic. Uh, I've had uh, folks ask us to do strategic planning and they want 20-year projections of what inpatient volumes and outpatient volumes are going to be. Well, if you asked me 20 years ago to make projections for 2024, 
I don't think I would come anywhere near what reality is. So we've got to think about a shorter term duration, but then also have regular updates and adjustments as we see things move from side to side. How do we start? Well, we start by understanding where you are. We have to know your service area, the demographics of your service area, how folks are utilizing healthcare services today, and what is our competition? What are the existing assets that we might have in order to help us execute on some of our strategies? Whether that's capital, you know, do we have some cash that if we needed to make an investment in a new service, in a new facility, in a new piece of equipment, that we can even do that? Or are we going to have a strategic plan that says, yes, we should make a facility investment of X million dollars, but we don't have any money to be able to do that. What are our physical assets? Where are they located throughout our market? Can we start to shift things between them? And who are our people? Do we need different providers? Do we need more providers? What's the uh, total demand in the market? What does the retirement of providers look like going into the future? And how can those things start to shape what we might need to do from a strategic planning perspective? First piece is, un piece is understanding the surface area. And you know, I think this is one of those issues that um, I think there's a ton of variability out there. You know, oftentimes uh, we'll work with a client that says, well, our county is our service area. Okay, that's fantastic. Or there's a hospital district or historically you've defined your service area as X. So a couple of questions that we might ask, are we the dominant provider in that service area today? Oftentimes as a critical access hospital, on the inpatient side, we're certainly not the dominant provider. Perhaps we dominate the emergency department volumes. Perhaps we're getting the majority of the primary care, but are we getting the dominance in everything? Do we want to, do we need to? Who else might be playing in there? If we've got larger service areas, it's often a great time during strategic planning to think about subdividing those. We don't want them to overlap. They want to stay non-overlapping so that we're never double counting the same patient. But we want to think about, is there a northern part of our submarket of our service area? Is there a southern part? Do those populations need different things? Do we want to put assets into different areas? Oftentimes when it results in a facility plan, one of the questions is, who does this project benefit? If we're locating a clinic in the northern part of a community and it's the hospitals located in the southern part of the community, those folks up north might have historically thought, well, no one is ever thinking about us in terms of our investment, of investments from the hospital. So really asking that question and beginning to answer it in our strategic planning is important. I will say that patient origin studies are very, very helpful here. Uh, it does not need to be a super detailed, every CPT code broken out by zip code. But even if we just looked at a couple of high level buckets, what is the origin of patients in our emergency department? Total ED patients by zip code, and we look at that for a given year. That will give us a sense, let's take the map on the screen, you know, if 83% of our folks come from the orange area, 17% are coming from someplace else, that's a pretty good indication that the orange area is our primary service area. If instead we looked at that and said, only 40% of our patients are coming from the orange area, then perhaps we need to broaden that so we can capture more of them. I would break it out by emergency. I would look at inpatient separately, particularly in critical access hospitals, given that our inpatient volumes are often somewhat lower. I would look at imaging, roll up all of your imaging volume together, and does that mirror what our emergency department is? Clinics, again, in aggregate, not for each practice, but for the clinics in general, does that mirror what we think our service line is? And if we do procedures, oftentimes, you know, as a critical access hospital, we may be the only player in a given area that's doing procedures and so folks are coming from further afield that helps us when we get into data sources later on once we understand the service area we want to understand the population that lives within it what's happening today and what's projected to happen into the future what's the distribution of ages and what's the growth in each one of those age cohorts uh, anyone that's ever worked with me or heard a version of this presentation uh, will often hear me say uh, well you know in the 65 plus age cohort you have 13.9 or 18.2 or 7.3 percent growth over the next five years and what do we know about those folks 
those folks utilize healthcare services more frequently than the younger population. So it's important for us to think about that. The other one is special groups. Uh, oftentimes, if we're located near a university, uh, we're located near a large prison, uh, those folks may not be captured in the underlying demographics, and we may have to change our assumptions relative to the overall market size. Uh, also, while we're thinking of demographics, we think about the dynamics of the market. Who are the competitors in the area? Are there new entrants? What's going on relative to the underlying healthcare needs and services that are being offered? And then finally, it's really important to think about health equity when we're doing strategic planning and thinking about the demographics, because oftentimes folks that are perhaps disadvantaged from an equity standpoint aren't utilizing the healthcare services, either because they don't know about them, they don't have access to them, transportation, language barriers, socioeconomic barriers, whatever it may be, yet they still have underlying healthcare needs. And so we really want to think about that in our strategic planning as well. Once we understand the market and we understand the demographics of the market, then we start looking at what the utilization of services are inside of that market. And we start with the existing volumes. The best data that you will ever have for strategic planning sits on your electronic medical record today. That tells us who's actually showing up in the door of your hospital today. We can compare that to external sources that say we were expecting to see 14,000 people from this zip code and you saw 1,400, you have 10% theoretical market share. I wish all states were equal in terms of how they captured and collected uh, outpatient market data. Uh, some states do a really great job with inpatient data. Not many do a great job with outpatient data. Uh, so really coming up with a theoretical market share is oftentimes the best that we can do. Uh, but we can break things down by inpatient and outpatient and understand what the projected growth is on a service line basis. Is there enough growth in a market for us to offer that service line? And what's the share that we would need in order to make that profitable or in order to make that justifiable inside of our market? The other important piece, and strategic planning is really the time to do it, is understanding wants versus needs. And that's where data really helps and kind of the third party dispassionate voice in the room that says, I know that you'd really like to begin offering, I'll pick on obstetrics because they always get, uh, they always get picked on, uh, but you'd really like to do obstetrics. And we look at the market, we had a client up in Oregon a few years ago uh, where we looked at it and said, the entire market, there are 170 births per year. And if you're going to only do kind of the lower acuity things, let's let's strip 15% of those births out. Now, if I captured 100% market share, I'm going to do 155 births and I'm not going to capture 100% market share. So bring that number down. Eventually we got to the point where the amount of C-sections that they may do was going to be so small as to not be able to be viable in terms of keeping providers kind of at the top of their game uh, and safe in doing those things. They made a choice not to invest in that. So it was a want, but the community really didn't need it necessarily. Because when we think about balancing those wants and the needs, we also have to understand every dollar we invest in one thing is a dollar that we're not investing someplace else. Uh, and whether those are dollars or those are hours available of care or their facilities, everything that we do in one area means that we can't spend that same thing in another area. We understand the existing utilization, then we have to start thinking about what's happening going forward. Uh, the continued shift from inpatient to outpatient uh, accelerates. You know, I think I've been at Stroudwater since 2009, uh, and you know, certainly in rural communities, we're seeing more and more and more outpatient care being delivered and very, very little inpatient care in many scenarios. Uh, technology shifts are driving some of that. Insurance is driving some of that. Uh, lots of things drive it. Virtual care is also something that is driving that. Uh, you know, I think the blessing and the curse for many of our organizations as we came out of COVID, uh, you know, during COVID, we had to figure out ways to deliver things virtually. You know, I figured out a way to deliver a rapid strategic plan virtually, never going on site to the client but instead doing that all over Zoom because they needed to do the work 
and we needed to figure out a way to help them to make that happen. The same thing happens though on our healthcare side where as things shift into a virtual method or a virtual mode, that may mean we need less bricks and bucks. We need less facilities to do that. Uh, it'd be great if we can capture all of that virtual, but once I'm logging onto my phone to get care or onto my iPad or onto my computer to get that care, it really doesn't always matter to me whether it's my local hospital providing it or it's somebody else on the other side of the world providing that. Uh, and that drives some of the changes in market share that we've got to think about. You know, what are our, what's our existing competition? Do we have an opportunity to take from someone else because we think that we can deliver higher quality care at a lower cost perhaps? Uh, or are people coming into our market, whether they be physical or virtual, to take market from us? And what might we have to prepare against? So that all starts to tee up thinking about a strategic plan because we have to understand where we're going. That's why we develop a strategic plan. So we take those market dynamics and the potential impact, a new competitor coming into the market, if it was to drive our volumes down 15%, what would that mean for us? Somebody else that might be struggling in the market, they go away. I have a client in the Pacific Northwest right now that's concerned about a hospital that might close in their area and it overwhelming their capacity to provide care for their community. You know, because it's a bigger hospital, it's a little bit further away, but people are already coming to the smaller hospital, our client, right now. And that becomes a challenge because I could have this tsunami of folks coming in. Sorry for the Pacific Northwest folks uh, to joke about a tsunami, but I could have this large bolus of patients suddenly coming in and overwhelming my system that was designed to provide care for a smaller service area. Thinking about the strategy both in a you know, economic as well as a facility requirement uh, is something to do in strategic planning. Once we've set that vision though, then it's about developing strategic and tactical plans that enable us to start to go from where we are to where we want to be. And, and apparently not backwards in the slides. So we've got to think about when we're doing strategic planning, how do we get grounded in reality? Because the payment model is going to move with or without us. Right, we are done with pure fee for service, no links to quality and value. Right, there's everybody's got some links to quality, some links to value in their fee for service world. So, I would say category one in this map doesn't really exist. We're in category two and moving on up. If we jump all the way to category four, it makes life easier, at least to conceptualize. Think of it as a Kaiser Permanente, right, where the population based payment, I'm the insurance uh, provider. Everything that I do, I'm doing to keep that patient population well, but every time someone shows up in the hospital, that's actually costing me money. So I wanna do everything I can to keep that care cost even lower. But as we go through this, we have to remember that we're being asked by the government, by payers, by everyone to do more with less. Our expenses are continuing to rise higher than reimbursements are rising for that. You know, if we see a you know basket, increase of 2.1% or 2.5%, yet our labor costs went up 7%, that math doesn't work out for too long. Uh, we've got to be thinking as we're going through everything, how do we make sure we're maintaining that focus on utilization of services, best time, best place for the appropriate cost, uh, and having the best outcomes together with that. So anyone that's heard one of my colleagues, Eric Schell, give a uh, presentation at virtually every state in the country, uh, probably except for New Jersey, um, is has heard about him talk about the shaky bridge, you know, kind of crossing over from that stable pillar of a true fee-for-service payment model to a very stable pillar of a population-based payment model. But it's really, really shaky as you're beginning to go across that. I had a client the other day talk about it, you know, a foot in two canoes. Uh, and thinking about how do we start to to move from one place to another while the water or the area or the ground under us continues to shift. Uh, the market forces at play during that require new strategies. We've got to think about what's different in the future. Just doing next year a little bit better than this year isn't going to suffice because our costs are increasing more than just a little bit each year. Uh, and so I would say all strategic plans need to think about how we're going to deal with that transitioning payment system, whether that's in the short term where we're just dipping our toe into an ACO 
Uh, we're dipping our toe into our own self-insured uh, employee population and thinking about those folks as a, pop, a mini population-based payment system. You know, how can we take the lessons learned there and begin to transition that to a broader market? So start with a focus on the here and now. All of these things that we're talking about long-term, getting into population-based payment, getting into accountable care organizations, uh, they're coming. Some of them are here already, but we still have a whole bunch of things that we can be working on today. The next piece is align with as many providers in the market as we can. Align does not mean employ, it doesn't mean acquire. It means try to make sure that as we're thinking about providing care for our broader community, that our providers, the providers that we employ, the providers that work with us, that have privileges, as well as others in the market have similar objectives for providing the best care for patients. Third one is to gradually build a population health infrastructure. Start by understanding what it is, then begin with some data collection, think about patient-centered medical homes. Once we've done that, kind of the crawl, then move to the walk, then to the run, then to the sprint. Maybe the walk is starting to think about hot spotting or evidence-based protocols, things that will then allow us to take on risk for a larger population, and all the while prepare for that evolution of a payment system from fee-for-service into a population-based model. One of the ways that we've looked at that at Stroudwater is using this graphic we call the transition framework. And just to kind of highlight the way that we've looked at that, uh, the top half of it is about transitioning the delivery system. The bottom half of it is about transitioning the payment system. And then the center area, the gray, or at times we've used a blue bar, uh, is the creation of a population-based health system. And so if we think about it, we're moving from that stable pillar of fee-for-service all the way to the left, eventually out to a population-based payment system. But as we go through in those various phases, when we think about the implement ovals, you know, orange implement, blue implement, it's at that point today, the here and now in phase one, we've got to be thinking about improving quality and efficiency. That's the name of the game, patient safety, quality, efficiency. We've got to be planning for alignment of our providers. This says primary care, but I would argue that it's all providers in our market. We've got to think about planning that by the time we get to phase two, that's when we're striking on that. The third line, rationalizing the service network. This is coming together with other organizations, other systems, other providers to wring out waste from the system, right? To think about, you know, what are the areas that cost us, that cost patients the most in rural healthcare, it's often not the rural hospital. It's the big city hospitals. It's the big billion dollar glass towers, bricks, bucks, technology, super subspecialists. When we think of designing a healthcare system for our local community, we're not thinking about bringing in every piece of technology and every super subspecialist. As we get closer to a population-based payment system, we have to think about trying to wring some of that waste out of the system. Simultaneously with each one of those phases though, there's a corresponding implementation on the payment system side. While we're improving our quality and efficiency and patient safety today, we should be thinking about acting on employee, uh, employed staff health plans, uh, fee-for-service payments with incentives tied to quality and value, all of that stuff, that's money that can be on the table today that we can think about implementing to help us in the short term from a financial perspective. We can plan to start getting into some of those shared savings payments, whether those are ACOs or other types of arrangements. And then finally moving into a full risk payment. Again, oftentimes that's going to be in concert with larger organizations, larger service networks, because as an individual critical access hospital or rural hospital, it's difficult for us to think about being in that full risk area. I mentioned before kind of the crawl, walk, run, sprint, of the creation of a population-based payment system. So when we think about data analytics, evidence-based protocols, those are those crawling pieces. Once we understand the data and we've got a sense as to best practices from a clinical standpoint, we can then move into direct contracting with payers, value attribution. How are we capturing the value that we create in the health system? We think about you know, the old 
um, the old HMOs back in you know back in the day, you know the every time that we would reduce utilization, the only person that got anything out of that was the insurance company. They monetized that value because you reduced utilization, or they said we're not going to pay for that. The patient still made their same premium payment. The employers made their same premium payment. And they weren't monetizing, they were monetizing the insurance company was monetizing that creation of value. Everything that we do today to keep someone well and out of the hospital, unless we're able to start monetizing that value as the health system, that's just going to the insurers. So we've got to think about how do we balance those two things. When we think about strategic planning though, what we try to do is take this framework that I've walked through and organize that into five key themes. Theme one is about quality and efficiency. Theme two about our provider network. Theme three about the overall service network. Theme four about the creation of a population-based population health system. And theme five, that shifting payment transformation. It's important to think about, you know, what are the pieces of strategic planning? Starting with a vision, right? We've got a vision of who we want to be. We then use those five themes and from those five themes, break them down into goals. We would like to accomplish X, Y, Z. For each one of those goals, create some action items as to how we might do that. And then we'll want to measure that. One of the pieces that we often leave out of strategic planning quite intentionally is the tactical planning piece. And the reason that we do so is when we're doing a strategic plan, oftentimes we're doing what with the senior leadership, the medical staff, the board, and not necessarily the folks that are down in the trenches every day doing the work with the patients. And those are the folks that are often best able to create the tactical plan. So what we try to do is develop a framework that starts with the vision, goes through the themes, the action items, and then let the person that is responsible for executing that, for making it happen, let those folks create a tactical plan. I uh, once did this for a client in Oregon, and their idea of tactical planning uh, was a giant project management system called Reich, I believe. And there were 635 individual elements that they broke out. All of the things we talked about, maybe we had 60 things that we were thinking about. They had 10 steps for each one of those 60 things in order to get what they needed to do. So again, just another way to think about that. Vision becomes themes, becomes strategic goals, which are high level. They're organized under the themes and should have an overall goal leader from our senior leadership team. The action items, we're gonna ask for each one of those goals, how can it be achieved? And it should have an action item leader, either someone on our senior team or someone that it's been delegated and assigned to, but everything rolls up to someone from that senior team. The tactical planning piece, those get developed and shared by the leaders to ensure ownership with those that are actually creating it, and then developing measurements and metrics. Is there an end point that we're striving for and by when? Is there a progress metric that we're looking for to achieve in the interim? Did this for a client a few years ago that had unfortunately seen their leapfrog rating uh, drop down to a C. And so you know, it was going to take a period of time before they could get enough scores to drive that, to make a meaningful change with that letter grade, but they needed to have some progress so they knew they were on the right path. So identifying a progress metric is often as important, if not more, than setting our end metric that we're trying to strive for. So again, we think back to that transition framework graphic. These are those five key themes, quality, patient safety, and operating efficiencies. That's the here and now the medical staff network, making sure that we're aligning with our providers that are employed, that are affiliated, and even those that aren't. Uh, bigger systems coming together for clinical services networks, population health management creation of that process, and doing all of that while thinking about the transitioning payment systems. We'll often come up with you know, a series of goals. Each one of those goals will have a series of action items, but it is critically important that you go through a prioritization exercise. Uh, this one is relatively small, 15 goals became 46 action items. But if I told you that there were 46 things to do, it is virtually impossible to accomplish 46 things with the same focus. 
And so even if we're spreading those out, obviously we wouldn't want a single individual to even have 10 things that they're dealing with. Uh, we asked the board, we asked the management team to go through a prioritization exercise and they identified 15 things that were identified as high priority. Those became where they were going to expend their resources in the short term. Those became the areas they went straight to tactical plan leaders and said, develop a plan. We'd like to see progress on this in three months. Again, progress metric, not the end goal. But the key as we're developing this, that theme one, really the patient safety, quality, and operating efficiency, that is the here and now. Those are the things that we need to be doing today, regardless of future shifts in the payment system. I've been giving a version of this talk now for three or four years, and we just keep kind of pushing the goal line out for when we think we're going to get to a more population-based payment system. Eventually, we'll need to do something different than we're doing today. We're on an unsustainable expenditure track uh, inside of uh, healthcare inside the U.S., certainly, uh, but perhaps everywhere as well. We've got to think about the here and now and what can we do to be more efficient, to improve quality, to improve safety, uh, and keep our, keep our rural hospitals alive. Uh, developing tools for measuring things. Again, this is uh, taken as a, as a simple example from uh, a client out in the Northwest that was looking at you know, their key goals on here, become the employer of choice, achieve highest quality safety and satisfaction scores throughout the region, explore services, grow services to grow volume and market share, uh, evaluate and develop other revenue sources and continue to improve financial strength. We then said, okay, for all of those goals, what are the ways that you can measure that? And then is it important for us to be measuring it? Because if it's not, then let's not waste any time tracking less important information. The overarching goal as we're thinking about measuring things should be to improve the care of the patients in the community, ensure that we're still around, right? We want to ensure financial sustainability, viability of our health network. We don't want to see someone, you know, close a rural hospital, we've seen too many of them already, and increase the efficiency of communication. I note here board to management, that was what was important with this particular client, but I think it's also management to staff, management to medical staff, staff to patients, making sure that we're able to tie into things that we can accurately measure and show progress moving forward. So as I think about wrapping up, Again, the keys to success, if we're going to do a strategic plan well, it's to make sure that you are the authors of the plan, your internal stakeholders, whether that's your medical staff, that's your board, that's your management team, you've got to be the authors of the plan. Consultants come and go, unfortunately clients come, or um, executives come and go as well, but you're the ones that are tied into the market and have the true kind of need to keep that healthcare institution alive. Uh, ground the planning in the realities of local, regional, and national healthcare market. Uh, don't think that just because you want something, it is going to be. There is kind of an overall movement throughout the country, throughout various regions, towards certain types of care, and trying to buck those trends become pretty challenging. Uh, use real data. Uh, don't use supposition. Uh, there are lots of data sources out there. Uh, some are certainly better than others but the data that you have in your own systems is the starting point. That lets you know from where your patients are coming. It lets you know what services people are utilizing. Uh, streamline the process to keep focus. Uh, so I would say that you know, I've done strategic plans that take six months. I've done strategic plans that take one week. Uh, the one week version, assuming that you've had enough time prior to that week to develop the data, to you know, have a very streamlined process, uh, it can be done and it really works well to be able to leave at the end of the week with a really good progress document sitting in front of you. Uh, organize your plan to transition the delivery system and the payment system in unison. Make sure to prioritize the here and now. Don't just focus on what might be in the future because if we think too far about the future, oftentimes we're going to lose the things that need to be done today. Uh, measure, track, and adjust as necessary. And then finally, celebrate success. It's really important that we're you know, validating the time and energy that folks put into strategic planning. Uh, if you do a process where you interview a whole bunch of folks, uh, one of my biggest pet peeves 
is I go interview 15 people at a hospital. We do some work, and those 15 people that happen to come back, you know, two years later for a different project, and those 15 people say, whatever happened with that strategic plan? Remember you asked me some questions? Uh, I think it's always best practice to make sure that the senior team is going back out to everyone that was spoken to as part of a planning process to let them know what came out of that. Uh, that's part of celebrating success. Folks don't know that you're successful if you don't tell them what you're trying to achieve. Uh, so with that, that is the, uh, that's the end of my prepared slides. Uh, we've got uh, 21 minutes on my clock and I am very happy to take any questions you all might have. Uh, my email and phone number is up here. Uh, if you wake up in the middle of the night and say, hey, you know, I really should have asked that question or I, I just felt awkward asking it in front of folks, uh, feel free to just shoot me a note and I'm happy to have a uh, conversation offline, point you in a direction uh, for other information as needed. Uh, Cody. Yeah, thank you so much for all the information. We, we really enjoy it. I've got a couple questions I want to I want to present to you, but I want to go ahead and remind the audience now to go ahead and put those questions in now. I know that was a lot of information, so don't worry. There is a recording coming tomorrow. Um, you can share that with anybody. Um, so it's a great time to ask questions so they can hear all of the things that you might or maybe hear what they're already thinking when they're watching the recording. But so we'll dive in here, but go ahead and use that control panel at any time. Um, what types of data are most helpful when undertaking a strategic planning process? Sure. So I talked about uh, a couple of them in the in the chat or in the discussion. Uh, the first is your own data, being able to look at your actual patient data over a period of time. I would say ideally it's a minimum of three years, sometimes a little longer than that, uh, to be able to understand historically what's happened, understand some of the trends there. Uh, patient origin studies are another key, particularly as we think about validating what our service area is. Uh, state data, uh, to the extent that it is good, <laughs> um, you know, it's oftentimes on the inpatient side, we're able to roll that up to DRGs and only hospitals are providing inpatient care. So we get a good sense as to share. Uh, outpatient, it is often uh, worth less than uh, the paper that it's printed on, uh, just because of the garbage in, garbage out rule. Uh, there are also proprietary data sources out there that you know folks can purchase data from uh, things like it used to be Thomson Reuters, then Truven, then uh, IBM Watson, and now Meritiv. Uh, SG2 has a great set of data. Uh, the key is just making sure that as you're looking at that data, is it localized to your particular community? Uh, things are much different in. I live outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, utilization and the types of care provided are different in Boston, Massachusetts than they might be you know, in rural uh, Illinois or rural Louisiana, uh, just because of access to specialists. So looking at those types of things uh, from a proprietary perspective can also be helpful as long as it's uh, generated by zip code or by census tract or something. Okay, thank you. It looks like somebody said, Oh, somebody left because they lost audio. Barb, if, if you can hear me, I'll make sure that you get this recording. Don't worry about that. Um, and then you can always reach out to John for slides. Um, next question, what's the board's role in strategic planning? That's a great question. So um, my ideal process is that the board gets involved at the very beginning. Uh, the board sees the initial data. They understand what's happening globally or you know, regionally and nationally. Uh, in terms of the market so that they have that common uh, fact base. We then typically would recommend the board gets interviewed either in groups or individually, it depends on the size of the board and what their policies are relative to uh, too many board members in a room together, triggers uh, sunshine types of things. Uh, but having some individual discussion with the board, because oftentimes they're the community members that are supporting the hospital. They're the business owners. Uh, so their role in terms of understanding what they think is going well and what things, what things might have to change uh, going forward is really helpful. And then finally, I would say as you create a strategic plan, particularly if you can do a focused energy to develop something you know, in a short period of time, having the senior team present that draft plan back to the board, the board to take about 30 days to read through, understand it a little bit more, 
and ask questions or ask for clarifications, and then ideally come back and the board actually says, yes, this is our adopted strategic plan. We're going to vote on that, and we're going to ideally hold our management teams accountable, you know, whether it becomes for some of their incentive compensation or anything else for particular things that are measured in that strategic plan. So the board is critical uh, as a partner in developing that. Great, thank you so much. Um, go ahead and put your questions in now. We can get to those. We've got plenty of time. Uh, another question, how often should a strategic plan be refreshed? So I would say that in an ideal world, a three-year strategic plan is the starting point. I think when you look too, sh too short time, if it's less than three years, uh, oftentimes you don't have enough runway to accomplish some of the bigger goals that you may, that you may set out. Uh, but if you look too far out into the future, either you just say, I'll get to it tomorrow, I'll get to it tomorrow, I'll get to it tomorrow. Uh, I've had clients ask for 20-year projections. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, it's just not run. It's not just not right to do it. Uh, you know, I can tell you that any consultant that can say with accuracy what is going to happen 20 years from now is either lying or crazy, um, you know, because you are you have a choice of being, you know, wrong or, you know, partially wrong or exactly wrong, uh, I want you to be directionally correct. And directionality I can achieve inside of kind of a three-year window. Now, that also doesn't mean that if you solve everything, I keep bringing up this client in the Pacific Northwest uh, where we did a rapid strategic plan for them, uh, it was a three-year horizon. They called us back 18 months later and said, the board would like you to do an audit of the strategic plan because we, we think we've done everything. And the board said that's impossible. And we looked at it and said, no, you've in fact done all of the things that you set out. Now, maybe that's a bad on us and bad on them for not being bold and ambitious enough to put out some of those wild goals. But we just said, OK, 18 months, it's all done. Let's set the next three year plan. And so they're working through that plan at this point. Great, thank you. Um, I do have a couple questions about slides. If you are interested in receiving the slides, please feel free to reach out to John. He'll get those to you. But don't forget that I also have a recording coming tomorrow. Um, another question for you, John. Is there an ideal size for a strategic planning committee or work group? Uh, so I would say the it mostly depends on how you all work together. Uh, I think ideally you have the senior team, you know, whether that's the C-suite, or it's the folks that sit around you know, your, your weekly senior team meetings. If that's six or eight, 10 people, seems like a reasonable number. Uh, once you get too far above 10, I think it becomes more challenging to keep everyone's focus. Um, and it just you know, it starts to be the law of diminishing returns. Uh, the bigger issue though, is making sure that whatever process you take, if it's eight people or six people or 10 people, uh, make sure that that process is facilitated in a way so that you're getting information from everyone. It's not just the loudest voice, uh, it's not just the CEO, it's not just the president of the medical staff, uh, but really if there are folks that aren't super gregarious and outgoing, uh, being able to pull information from them because either they're going to be asked to implement something eventually, or they have just fantastic knowledge to share that has to be pulled out of them. So I'd say, you know, 10 is kind of a top number in terms of that, of that process, but then it does get broken down into individual components and that can get rolled out to, you know, 20, 30, 100 people inside of an organization, depending on, on the service that's being addressed at the moment. Thank you. I, I do have a question. I'm going to share this, Jackie. I hope I, I'm not saying this wrong. Should we establish a big, hairy, audacious goal? It's a board interest. Uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's fantastic to put uh, the old BHAG from business school uh, out there. Um, you know, as long as that goal is, you know, realistic. Uh, and I don't mean, you know, realistic in terms of, you know, easily achievable. I think it should be audacious. But if you said, you know, our goal in, especially if we're thinking of a three-year strategic plan, if our goal in three years is to uh, not have any inpatients in our facility, uh, forget about what that means from an economic standpoint, but just from a pure, you know, public health perspective, uh, we will have no inpatients in our facility because we are going to deliver everything virtually or at home. Uh, I don't think that's a realistic thing for us to be thinking about. And so while it may 
sound like a cool buzzword, uh, we want to have some reality in there. If we said, however, you know, I am a, you know, I'm a little critical access hospital in Louisiana, and I want to have, you know, I want to be the number one scoring quality uh, HCAPS uh, facility in the entire state of Louisiana. You know, that might be audacious. It also could very much be achievable. Uh, we have an example of a, of a longstanding client uh, in a northeastern state that when you look at all of the academic medical centers, you look at all of the uh, smaller uh, critical access hospitals, uh, community hospitals, they are the number one in terms of all of the HCAP scores. Uh, they lead the entire state well above state and national medians. Uh, so, you know, it is certainly achievable, uh, but you want to have something that you truly can get. I learned a new term today. I felt silly. I had not heard that before. So thank you for that. Um, I don't have any other questions at this time, but please feel free to uh, enter them still if you want. John, I'll turn it over to you for closing remarks. No, um, thank you all for, for your attention today. Uh, I love doing these presentations because I feel like, you know, whether it's with Stroudwater or it's with anyone, uh, all of our rural hospitals should be thinking strategically. Uh, we should all be thinking about, you know, what is it that we need to do in order to make ourselves invaluable to the communities that we serve and make sure that we're around 10, 20, 30 years from now. Uh, if there are any questions, you, know, you wake up in the middle of the night and say, hey, you know, this just came to me, write it down on your bedside. Uh, feel free to, to shoot me an email or give me a call uh, at any time and I will, uh, I'm happy to, to have a conversation to follow up. Uh, I can send out the slides to anyone that's interested. Just send me a note saying, you know, please send the slides. I know that uh, Cody's going to send the uh, the audio version of this, but uh, I will send out uh, the PowerPoint version as well. It's not a giant file. It's only about six megabytes. Uh, so my information is right here on the screen. Uh, and thank you so much. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. And thank you for our audience for your questions today and your participation. We really appreciate you joining. Please don't forget to take that survey at the end. It is really important to help us make sure that we're presenting the best information to you and you're getting the education on things that you want. Um, have a wonderful day, everyone. Be safe and we'll see you next time. Thank you.